Today we're going to talk about what's new in acute stroke care. Before we begin, just a little bit about myself. My name is David Woodruff. I began my career as a paramedic. I worked out in the field for a number of years before I went to nursing school, and that gave me the opportunity to be able to see the healthcare setting from the outside. So I got to see who was actually providing the care to the patients, and it was the nurses at the bedside. Now that's what drove me into nursing, is I liked the fact that the nurses were implementing the intervention and actually got to see the outcome of that intervention occur in their patient. After nursing school, I worked in a variety of different areas, including medical intensive care, surgical intensive care, neuro intensive care, and a level one trauma center. I taught medical surgical nursing for seven years, critical care nursing for three years, and I've been teaching continuing education for the past 12. As you may imagine, I began my career when I was fairly young, <laughs> but uh, since then I have found that there's many, many things that I don't know about nursing. And so hopefully we'll be able to talk about what some of those things are today as we then talk in addition about some new things about how to manage our patients who have stroke. Now, if you have any questions that don't get answered as we go through and talk today, or maybe you think of a question after the program is over or next week or whatever the case may be, feel free to send me an email. My email address is up there on the screen for you, so that ought to make it a little bit easier for you to be able to uh, get that information to me. So uh, go ahead and feel free to send me an email if you have any questions either today or later on. So let's start out talking about what is stroke. So flip over in your handout to page one, and let's talk a little bit about what is a stroke. Now, stroke typically is going to be defined as either, it's going to be a disruption of blood flow to the brain from one mechanism or another. One mechanism that probably most of us think of when we think of stroke would be an ischemic type of stroke. With an ischemic stroke, we have a blockage of a blood vessel that is causing ischemia in the brain. So we're getting an ischemic type of event occurring in the brain. The other kind of stroke we could have would be hemorrhagic. In a hemorrhagic stroke, we would have a blood vessel that is burst, causing bleeding into the brain. Now there's going to be two effects that result from that hemorrhagic stroke. First of all, the blood is going into the brain tissue instead of going to the area where it's supposed to be supplying oxygen and nutrients, so that's one problem, so there's actually a decrease in blood flow to that area. Secondly, we have blood taking up space in the skull, which is going to increase intracranial pressure and cause pressure on part of the brain. Now, as you can see from our picture here, it's illustrating on the left-hand side there that we have some kind of occlusion. So we have something that is occluded that blood vessel there. Typically, that's going to be a clot, and it's typically, typically going to be a thrombus. So the vast majority of these come from thrombi, which means that that's an atherosclerotic process. There are some, of course, that would come from emboli, an embolus that could have occurred in the heart and then be thrown up to the brain, and then that can cause the patient to have a stroke too. But the vast majority of these are going to be caused by atherosclerotic disease, which then causes the patient to have a thrombus form and a progressive decrease in the amount of oxygen and nutrients that are getting to the brain. So that's how that is working. Now what happens is we get ischemia, injury, and necrosis occurring to the brain. So we want to be looking for the possibility of any of those three things occurring at any time in any of our patients who we think could be at high risk for stroke. Let's talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. First of all, it's helpful to understand that stroke is on a continuum. So there's a continuum of this process that starts out with being atherosclerosis, developing into a TIA, and then developing into acute ischemic stroke. So this is a continuum kind of a process, as illustrated in the middle of page one in your handout. Now, transient ischemic attacks, there's also been other names for these over the years, uh, other types of designations, again, indicating that these are going to be a transient type of event. However, what happens is that the patient is going to have temporary focal neurologic findings that disappear, that go away, that subside, that get better. But the damage is permanent. 
Okay, now in the past, I think most of us thought about TIAs as being a temporary event. So the damage and the symptoms went away. Well, you know, of course, the patient came in, the patient's got left-sided weakness, and within maybe uh, 15 minutes or so, the patient no longer has that left-sided weakness. And we think, oh, there was a TIA, and it got better. Now, isn't that the same way the patient is going to view this? It got better, right, because the symptoms went away. Now, what we need to understand is just because the symptoms went away doesn't mean that the problem went away. It doesn't mean that the patient has no uh, underlying pathophysiology. And, in fact, the patient will. The patient will have underlying damage to the brain. So what we found is that with a TIA, your patient will have permanent damage to the brain and the symptoms go away. Now, if you're looking at the diagram in the middle of page one again, where it says atherosclerosis, TIA, and stroke, all right, you would understand that this is a continuum kind of process, the same way as it is with the heart. Your patient who has heart problems typically is going to have some precursors to that big MI. So many patients who have heart problems are going to have stable angina, unstable angina, then they have the myocardial infarction. The coronary disease gets worse. Or maybe the patient has had progressive chest pain off and on for periods of time, and then the patient has the myocardial infarction. So again, you can see that continuum working with the heart. But the continuum also works here with the brain and with stroke. So we have the atherosclerotic process at work here, which then causes a TIA and then causes stroke. The TIA typically is going to be a smaller area that is occluded and or maybe part of it gets revascularized or the reason why symptoms go away is because other parts of the brain take over the function for the part that's involved. If other parts of the brain do not take over the function for the part that's involved, then it becomes a stroke. Then we have permanent symptoms. So typically, these things are going to be on this kind of a continuum. And your patient may have ha had several previous TIAs or events where the patient has had a change in their neurologic function before they actually have that stroke. So what we want to be doing is educating our patients about the signs and symptoms of stroke so they can catch it at the TIA stage. And our patients who have TIA, this is our opportunity to teach. So what we want to do there is we want to catch the patient with the TIA, tell them what, what TIA really is. Just because your symptoms went away does not mean that you're well, which is what many of your patients are going to think. Instead, we want to tell them that your symptoms went away, but there's permanent damage that's occurred to your brain. We need to change some of these risk factors, and you need to be compliant with your medications if you expect that things are going to change long term. So what kind of symptoms can we expect to see in our patient who's had a stroke? Well, it kind of depends upon what part of the brain is involved. Okay, so it's going to kind of depend on what part of the brain is involved. At the bottom of page one, there's some basic clinical presentations that we may see. And we're going to talk more specifically about the ones that we really need to hone in on when we're doing our patient teaching. But the part of the brain that's involved is going to have a big effect on what kind of symptoms we're going to see in our patient. So when we're taking a look at the brain here, and we're getting a look at all the different functional areas of the brain, keep in mind that whatever part of the brain is involved, whatever vessel it is that's involved, is going to have a dramatic uh, impact on what kind of symptoms that we end up seeing in the patient. So let's just take a look at some of these different functional areas and what they do. First of all, we've got the frontal area. So the frontal area here is responsible for abstract thought and for reasoning. It does a lot of functions here in the thinking processes. So this is one of the areas of the brain that we have a lot of strokes. And what we're going to see is the patient's going to have some disconnected thinking. Also in the frontal lobe, this is where we come up with the ideas that we may form into speech. So your patient may have problems with their speech, not because they can't talk, but instead because they're having a hard time putting the thought or idea into what could be a word then to be spoken. 